Well, welcome everyone. It's good to have you here for today's webinar. Uh, I'm looking forward to today's conversation and really because this is a, a passion area for me. Through the years, I have found that every healthy church needs to have one key bold move in front of them to keep them pressing forward in the mission that God's called them to. And making bold moves is really the opposite of a church being stuck. It's, it's how healthy churches uh, help their vision become something that's actionable and that your church is actually moving towards. And we want to see that momentum. We want to see that traction in your ministry. So today we're going to be talking with three pastors who will share how God has used four specific bold moves of faith to shape their own congregations and leadership journeys through the years, and then have them offer their wisdom on leading change in their churches as they've engaged these bold moves. And we're going to explore how God has called these churches to uh, do things like this, become both multi-ethnic and multi-generational, uh, helping their churches go multi-site so that they can reach more people in their regions, improving facilities to specifically reach people in their mission fields, and then solving core needs in their communities. And there's some fun stories to share related to that. And our goal for this event is that you'll walk away empowered to clarify your next bold move and identify the systems and strategies so that you can accomplish that. Um, so today, uh, first of all, Amy, um, it's good to have you part of the webinar today. Great to be here as always, but I mean, we're in great company today with these That's three right. gentlemen. That's right. Yeah, and so uh, today we're joined by Derwin Gray. Uh, some of you may know Derwin. He's a lead pastor of Transformation Church near Charlotte. Um, some of you may know Derwin if you've played football through the years and you were hit by him at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but Derwin plays, uh, Derwin was a great player, but he's a much, much uh, better, I would say Derwin, sorry, much better pastor. And so it's good to have you in the conversations today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here on behalf of my wife, Vicki, to co-founder of Transformation yeah. Church and the Transformation Church family. Uh, we just we just appreciate the Unstuck group. Amy, Amy, Tony, you guys have, have blessed us, and so it's a privilege to be able to, to share with you guys. Mm -hmm. And if somebody is alive that I tackled, then you're pretty old. <laughs> 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 uh, also with us is Jonathan Smith and Jonathan and, and I actually met during COVID because he reached out and I had the opportunity to work with uh, Jonathan and his team at onechurch.to uh, where he's the lead pastor. Uh, this is a great church in the Toronto uh, metropolitan area. And Jonathan, I'm looking forward to sharing some of the stories from your ministry because your church is having a great impact in people's lives. But welcome to the conversation today. Hey, great to be here with all of you. A long time listener, first time caller. It's great to be with you. <laughs> Glad to have this conversation. I love this topic. These bold moves uh, made a seismic difference. And our work with the Unstuck Group has been uh, so instrumental in helping us do that. Yeah. And then lastly, uh, Rick Ashley, I was sharing with this group earlier, Rick has just brought a lot of transformation to the Hills Church. It's a great church in Fort Worth where they have three locations and we'll probably get to it. They're about ready to open a fourth location now in Dallas. Uh, Rick's been the lead pastor there. Rick, for for how long now? 34 years. 34 years. And so it's uh, so many great stories that I could be sharing. We'll dive into some of those today. But Rick, the, I mean, first of all, just thank you for giving 34 years of your life and your leadership to the mission of the of the church. And um, I know that um, there are, are hundreds, thousands of people that are thankful for your ministry. Uh, but thank you for sticking with it, not giving up, especially some of the challenging times that we've been through and then you've been through specifically, especially in recent years. Um, but it's good to have you uh, as well for today's conversation. Well, thank you, Tony. Uh, like uh, Derwin said, we appreciate the Unstuck Group. Uh, you've blessed our church. I appreciate your confidence and belief in local church. That's why I've done this as long as I have. I believe the local church is the trench, and this is where people meet Jesus and become changed. And I would be remiss if I did not say quickly, uh, I'm grieving today for all my pastor friends in Arizona because your Texas Rangers are World Series <laughs> champions. And we all celebrating that today, I know. 
<laughs> yeah, so now you know exactly when we're recording this, but the Rangers just last evening wrapped up the World Series and for the it's their first World Series. So congratulations. Yes, it is. I, oh wow. I, I will let you know though that my Cleveland Guardians are still the team in baseball that has now waited the longest to get a repeat World Series. So maybe next year will be the year. Uh, if you're joining us today, we would love for you to participate in the conversation. In fact, we have live chat available uh, where you can engage with the team. And since we're pre-recording this, Amy and I uh, will also be involved in that live chat. And if you have some questions specific to our conversation, feel free to include those in the chat uh, because at the end of this pre-recorded portion, we will have live Q&A. So we want to take some time to answer any specific questions you have. You know, the Unstuck team um, will be uh, will be engaging with you both during the event and then after. And so if we can't get to all the questions, don't worry. We'll make sure we follow up with you either directly or through future content. And if you want to tell your friends about this uh, or share key thoughts from our conversation today, don't hesitate to do that on social media, wherever, where, if you're, uh, let's see, on, if you're Facebooking, if you're Instagramming, um, if you're Xing now, is that what they call it? I don't know. Uh, but use the hashtag unstuck church if you want to share some of the key thoughts from today's conversation. Well, let's dive right in. Um, as I'm, uh, as I get started here, I want to talk about how we have to clarify foundation before we set a new direction. And the reason why is bold moves necessarily, uh, feel risky and risk can actually be good or bad. It's good when it's tethered to your mission as a church and you have clarified a clear foundation and it's bad when it's not. Um, if if we're just making change and implementing a bold move and it's not connected to our reason, our purpose for being the church, um, then it's just it's not going to be helpful for your ministry, obviously, and it's not going to have kingdom impact in the end. So before we get into the specifics of some of the bold moves that these churches have made and how they've been playing out in recent years, I wanted to start the conversation today by spending a little time talking about the foundation in each of these churches, and then um, how that was established to to bring unity and alignment in these churches before they started to press into some of the bold moves that they've experienced. So Amy, you wanna lead us off? Yeah, I think we'll start with Pastor Derwin. You know, Pastor Derwin, underpinning the bold moves that your church has made, I just see a very clear sense of what you believe, why you exist as a church, and what a disciple looks like. Could you just share a little bit about what that looks like at Transformation Church? The boldest move that was ever made is on the third day when Jesus walked out of that tomb. Because when Jesus walked out of that tomb, that was God's bold move of reconciling the world unto himself, not counting people's sins against them, not just only to be forgiven, but to be reconciled with God, alive with God, that the new creation was in breaking into the present. So I just want to hmm. put that there, that no, no matter what moves we make, we all ride on the coattails of the risen Christ. So uh, for us, <clears throat> my wife and I, we didn't go to church. And so we met Jesus. He was the most beautiful thing we had ever seen. We discovered the scriptures. And so as we began to plant a church, uh, the, the words vision came into being, right? And so I'm like, well, Jesus seems to have the greatest vision of all. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbors as you love yourself and go make disciples of everybody. And so the way we say that at Transformation Church is we are a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, mission-shaped community that loves God completely upward, ourselves correctly inward, and our neighbors compassionately outward. So for short, we say upward, inward, outward. And so if God shows up, it looks like a multi-ethnic, multi-generational family motivated and inspired by the mission of Christ to love God, to love ourselves, to love our neighbors, right? And so... That was that first initial bold move. And we believe that the world would look a lot better if all 8 billion people lived an upward, inward, outward life through the great grace of God. And so we, we laid that foundation and we were like, yes, 
But then what I didn't know that leading a pastor, uh, being a pastor meant that you have to develop systems and processes and uh, organizational <laughs> health and alignment. And that's why we call the unstuck group to get help. And so, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where it started is that we believe that Jesus has the greatest vision of all. And if we taste and see that the Lord is good, then we want to see that happen. So we're in the process now of looking for strategic ways to be so desperate that we have to innovate. Desperation produces innovation, but all for the purpose of seeing the vision come to being. And so uh, a bold move that we have is in the next 10 years, we want to have four multi-sites. And uh, praise God, we've already identified one, signed the contract. We're ready to, to rock and roll uh, because we believe Jesus is worth it. When he rose from the dead, he was like, follow me, trust me. So, so the vision is not only our guardrails, but the vision of the future motivates us to bring that future into the present. I love that. Uh, Rick, uh, it's been, it really has been fun to engage with you and your team over these last several years. And, um, you really have a unique history at the Hills and you've made some significant transformations in how you approach ministry at the church. So with that in mind, uh, how, how did you rally your congregation around identifying this is who we are as a church and this is what we're going to be about? So this is our identity and this is our purpose as a ministry. Uh, well, you know, we're a 67 year old church and the statistics say when churches get that old, it's very, very hard for them to change. And so one of the things then that I had to do constantly is remind people of the why. So our foundation is our mission statement, that we exist to make and grow followers of Jesus. Now, that's not negotiable. That should be the mission of every church. And those two verbs are important. We exist to make followers. Uh, here's the truth. Uh, I think Jonathan would say this. Derwin would say this. I don't get emails from lost people. <laughs> I get emails from saved people and I can spend all of my time trying to pacify saved people and forget about lost people. So part of my job as a leading pastor then is to keep before the church, the idea we're here to make followers. We're here for the people who aren't here yet and then make and grow. We don't want you just to be forgiven. We want you to be formed. We want you to learn the way of Jesus. So that is our mission. Now where I had to grow as a leader is that for, I thought once you got the mission established, you're ready to row. No, we had a mission. We didn't have a vision. Uh, and those are two different things. Mission is non-negotiable vision. I believe is that unique, specific, measurable way you're going to, as a church, pursue the mission in your context. Absolutely. And it wasn't until we got more uh, defined about our particular vision that we really begin to see the kind of transformation that uh, we all want. So that was, uh, but the foundation was the mission, but the mission is what you build on, but without a vision, you won't build. Hey, Jonathan, you moved into the lead pastor role about eight years ago after having been the associate pastor for nearly a decade, I believe at one church TO. Um, can you share with our, our participants today just a little bit about that transition and how you built on the foundation that existed while clarifying kind of a new path forward? Yeah, actually, I've been the associate pastor for eight, nine years, and I'd gone to Montreal to revitalize a downtown, downtown urban church there before they called me back. And coming back was not in uh, my wife's and I, uh, our model, our ethos towards ministry. We, we'd never gone back somewhere. We were always kind of going forward. But it was an invitation to come back into a situation we understood well. Uh, but it brought challenges and opportunities with it. The opportunity was we were following a healthy leader. It's always easier to follow a healthy leader than an unhealthy one because trust is eroded with unhealthy leadership. Uh, I inherited a great big piece of trust because the previous leaders were trustworthy. So I tell all the new staff that join our team, you know, if people trust you, it's only because someone was trustworthy before you. So be very mm -hmm. careful how you hold their trust. And so we build off character and integrity. On our team, we applaud character. We let the congregation and others to applaud competencies. Like you have to have them, but character is fashioned in the back room. 
And we, we make sure we highlight that and spotlight that. And the previous leadership of this church, they had that in spades. The challenge was probably because I had been the associate. I was there to support the lead's vision. I was there to get behind the direction. And although we are aligned very much philosophically and values wise, we have a very different leadership cadence. Uh, I'm not a, uh, I like change. Uh, I am not loyal to many traditions or methodologies to the mission and message. Absolutely. But I believe all those other things are only as long as they're helpful, as long as they're, as Rick mentioned, bringing people to Jesus, then I, I'm going to applaud that. I'm going to fuel it. But otherwise, uh, I'm probably going to dismantle it hmm. and begin to move in a different direction. <laughs> and part of the problem when I came back was uh, I knew them, they knew me, but they had to learn me as a leader, uh, as the lead. And I think sure. one of the problems was the climb was hidden in our environment because financially the church was just killing it. Hmm. But it was filled with a lot of boomers at the at the apex of their earning potential. And so I began the conversation. We can have some hard conversations now or some urgent ones in 10 years. And I knew that part of it was creating a catalyst that could lead to bold moves and significant shifts and change. And that wasn't creating out of nothing. It was just telling actually what is the story below the surface? How few people were actually coming to Jesus or engaged in our next gen ministries and highlighting that and using that as a catalyst for change. And our church's mission vision is simple. It's similar to probably Duran's and Rick's, you know, know God, love people, impact our city. We are all about impacting the city of Toronto and making a difference here. That if we close down this the city would grieve. That's that's what we want our, our church to be known as. So it was mixed with opportunity and challenge coming back here. Mm, great insights. Well, let's dive into kind of the next part of, of our conversation where we really talk through what bold moves churches should make. I think many pastors, they want to make bold moves in their church, but they don't know what moves to make or even maybe how to make them. So maybe let's spend some time talking about some of the bold moves that your churches have made. And what that was like for you as a leader. You know, we've asked each of you to join us today because we know that you've made some bold moves related to Derwin becoming multicultural and multi-generational, going multi-site, improving facilities, and solving core needs in your community. So I'd like to hear uh, just a little bit more about each of your stories. So Tony, where do you want to start? Yeah, Rick, why don't we begin with you at the Hills? You're pursuing a number of bold moves under this umbrella of asking for nations and generations. And so maybe if if you would, could you just tell us about some of the specific initiatives that are included in that vision? Well, we do have a five-year vision to ask for nations and generations. Uh, the nations component uh, is recognizing that we live in a very diverse community. People don't think of Fort Worth as diverse. Forty-seven uh, percent of my city is white. Twenty-seven percent is Latino. Seventeen percent African American. Six Asian and other. I want my church to look like my city, and it didn't. And so the bold move and most of our nation's uh, goals are highlighting our impact in our city where God is bringing the nations to mm -hmm. us and around the world where we can go and reach nations. Uh, we led off with this one. We want to see one person a day for the next five years surrender to Christ to be baptized. Mm -hmm. wow. We want to keep it mission focused through our first 649 days of this vision. We've had 675 oh, baptisms. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we want to become more multi-ethnic, uh, and we're seeing great growth in that. Uh, we want to bless asylum seekers in our city. Uh, uh, our goal is to help 25 families who are advocating. Uh, uh, we've helped to date 20 in our first two years. So those are, and, and then our generation's goals are to impact uh, our schools and our city in some different ways to be more involved in our foster system. Uh, like Jonathan said so well, we want our city to grieve if we weren't here. Hmm. Uh, and we want to see how we can impact our schools and uh, our people in need in our city. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the uh, vision goals that we're most excited about. You know, Rick, just in follow up, um, I mean, it's amazing, again, how God's using your ministry to see that level of transformation in people's lives. Some of some of the aspects of this vision, I have to think, especially in Fort Worth, Texas, maybe rub up against some political 
views and things like that. How, how have you led your church through that? Well, um, I think Jonathan and Daryl would be quick to say these last three or four years in ministry have been the toughest I've ever experienced. The polarization of our country, uh, the the political division, uh, COVID, uh, and so yes, uh, be- intentionally becoming a more uh, multi ethnic church has come at a price. We've seen people leave our church. Uh, We've seen people come to our church, uh, but we've seen a lot of people leave. I've, I've had some things put about me on Facebook that aren't very kind, and I understand that. But the, the biggest one is uh, I don't come to church to hear about politics. I come to hear the gospel. My response is, well, you've been hearing the gospel. Yeah. Let me take you to Ephesians 2, and let me just remind you the gospel is tearing down walls, and we're we're bringing heaven to earth, and we're building a church that's going to look like uh, the throne someday that we're all going to gather around. So so. The way I respond, Tony, is I keep taking people back to the Word of God and saying, is there any part of my vision that I have not grounded in the Scripture and in the mission of Christ to reconcile the world to Himself? If there's any part of that vision that is not grounded there, then you're willing, you can attack me. Mm-hmm. But, it, but if your problem is just you, you just don't like what God wants to do on the earth, then, then <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and, and let our vision be derailed. Mm-hmm. And so God has honored we, we we haven't seen a lack of a giving. We haven't seen lack of attendance. I have lost some people. And I think you have to understand anytime you pursue a bold vision, people who want comfortable traditional church that doesn't challenge them will walk away. And you have to ask yourself, am I willing to pay that price? Uh, we're going to drop the mic right there and just. Well, let's move to live Q&A, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Actually, Derwin, he sounds a lot like you in the way that you've envisioned uh, so many of us over the years on that topic. But I'd love to hear from you. Um, what's the biggest bold move that you know Transformation Ministries has on their their radar right now? Coming out of COVID, we recognized that people were hungry, and so a bold move was is we started a free grocery store called the Market. We feed over four hundred families a month, over ten thousand pounds of food. Uh, a bold move was when we first came to Indianland, South Carolina, we went to the public schools and said, how can we serve you? And they said, what do you want? We said, no, we don't want anything. We just want to serve you. They didn't trust us because most churches want something. The only thing we wanted to do was serve. So that one partnership is now turned into 10 and we provide backpack meals for hungry children. So we are getting ready to celebrate our one millionth meal Uh, that has been provided by our church in 13 years. Now, keep this in mind, too. uh, When we came to Indian land, (laughs) church planting experts said this is where church plants come to die. If you get one baptism a year, you're doing good. Well, we've seen God baptize over 2,000, and we've seen over 8,000 people come to faith. Um, And and so now... Um, another bold move that's not going to sound as bold, but trust me, it is, is the vo- the bold move of making sure your staff, number one, embodies the vision, number two, is unified behind the vi- vision, and number three, has alignment to the assignment, and number four, is a reproducer of all three of those things. And so as a younger leader... Um, I just assumed that other people would do what they say they're going to do because I would do that. And so what I found out is that's not the case. And so the bold move now is I inspect what I expect, but also understanding that if I see a red flag, address it immediately, because if not, on the back end, the taxes and the interest rate of pain is only going to increase and it becomes a vacuum that sucks other people out of it. Um, the devil does more damage from the inside than an atheist could ever do from the outside. And Derwin, the, those staffing focuses, I mean, I think another big, bold move you're looking at is expansion through multi-site. And you know, you replicate who and what you are. And so having that healthy core is probably a good predecessor to, you know, expanding your ministry. Can, 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 I, can I add this? And, and I, I want to hear what Jonathan has to say because I want to take notes. Um, 
early on at the beginning of our church, we're such a baby church. We're not even 14 years old yet. And um, there was this sense of pride, like our staff, it's people we've discipled out of the congregation. They just got baptized. We're doing such a great job. And part of that is true. But then you get to a point where their competency can't keep up with the scale of the church. My competency couldn't keep up with the scale of the church. That's why I call people like Pastor Rick and I have other mentors and I lean on the unstuck group. Like you always have to be growing. And so there's a sense of um, when people's competency no longer matches the vision, that's when we started to see a bunch of character issues begin to bubble up that we had to either disciple through. One of the things that my wife and I pray is this, Lord, reveal what needs to be healed, heal what's revealed, and remove what doesn't want to be healed. And so we're at a place now to where we need veteran leaders because we're going to plant four multi-sites in the next 10 years. And I think God is actually laughing because it's probably going to be double of that. <laughs> and I would, I would rather pray bold prayers that God still parts Red Seas than to be found saying, I'm not sure he can do it. I would rather be saying, you know what? I believe he can because he's done it before. That's good. So bold moves begin with bold prayers. I, I love that. Uh, Jonathan, um, you, I don't know if you even know this, but when we ta started to talk about this specific webinar around bold moves, I, I told the team, we have to get Jonathan Smith on this on this uh, webinar. And the reason why is three or four years ago, when I started to talk about vision and you started to use this term bold moves around the vision forward for the church, you were the first pastor, <laughs> the first church that I could convince to actually latch on to that language and leverage it to help rally your church. And in that effort, uh, uh, onechurch.to, you did, you embraced uh, several different bold moves, but the one that really stood out to me was about the impact you wanted to have outside the walls of your church. So would you share more about that specific bold move? Sure. Um, I think all of our bold moves, like we, we, we working with the unstuck, uh, group, we, we develop five bold moves. They're all outward focus because we realize the gravitational pull. I think Rick, you pulled this up. The gravitational pull is always towards us. And, uh, and I want to, I want to invert that. So you have to bring exponential energy towards, uh, reaching because it's easier to do the care part. So it's a like kind of the pastor leader thing. Pastors care, leaders dare. And I, I this is a tension. Mm -hmm. I say to our staff team, we cannot resolve these, t this tension. We need both. But uh, we need to lean in with that extra energy. So, you know, some of our bold moves were like uh, reaching one million Torontonians digitally per year. And we did that. That was an incredible bold move to get out of ourselves, uh, to blow open the, the doors of the church, to do justice to the Jesus way was really important to us because we're a church of 75, 80 nationalities. Mm -hmm. And justice issues wow. are really important you know, because systemic poverty, racism, uh, and even even in Canada, we have a, a terrible track record with First Nations people. And so uh, I think what the one you're alluding to, though, is our love army. Yes. Uh, so we launched during the pandemic a love army, uh, which w had a goal of doing 100,000 acts of goodness over the course of five years in the city of Toronto. And um, like it was bold. Like uh, we did it while we couldn't meet. We couldn't even meet in person. I think we had stricter lockdown Yes, uh, protocols, did. maybe then some, uh, maybe then Rick and Duran's church. I'm not sure. We had quite, quite, quite stringent uh, requirements around us, so we were closed a lot of it. But we, we just uh, believe in theology. We believe that the church is not a location. It's not even a gathering. It's not a moment or an event. It is living stones put together in a community, and it's deployed throughout the city. Uh, so. Uh, they're always on mission. And so we thought, how do we keep our volunteers engaged and our people, even though we can't meet? So we tasked them with 100,000 acts of goodness over the course of five years. Now, we we were so little faith. Duran, you're going to do more than four sites. Uh, we did it in two and a half years. In two and a half years, we accomplished 100,000 acts of goodness. 
Hmm. And uh, part of the underpinning of it was uh, this, we needed to make sure that it was innovative and anything innovative should be simple, not complex. Hmm. If, it, if innovation is more complexity, that's that's not innovation. And uh, in terms of how we handle innovation. So we, we made it really easy for people to report those acts of goodness and spur each other on, whether anonymously or not, through text messaging or app, whatever, to be able to record it that we could measure. Uh, and again, if you can't measure it, it's hard to celebrate it. Uh, right. And we used it to fuel mission uh, for the church. And for, we called it the front end of our discipleship plan. I preached uh, hundreds of sermons on reaching people. But behavior modification is incredibly hard. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. we know if them at school that they would leave their house and look at their neighbors differently. That was key. They began to behave differently. And then we have these monthly themes, whether it was we are planting churches because as followers that are planting, sorry, churches, trees, similar, right? <laughs> uh, planting trees because we're, we're, followers of Jesus are a part of creation care. Uh, responding to First Nations issues and coming alongside of them and caring for them. We rallied our church community monthly around themed moments as well as individually deployed them throughout the city. That was a bold move that has made a significant difference in our church community. I love that. You notice Derwin mentioned four campuses and Jonathan, 100,000 acts of kindness. And I mentioned one baptism a day. Uh, people want to have a vision. And I found out most churches don't, they don't have a vision. They have a slogan. That's right. Mm. You know, and, and slogans don't motivate. Yeah. People want to, the question when I started preaching a long time ago was how is your church different? The question today is how is your church making a difference? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people want to know their church is making a difference. And so I've got a church. Think about the, the bold moves in my ministry. We've gone from all acapella to only one service in 10 is acapella. We've gone from uh, uh, a church where you never saw a woman on the stage to where women can preach. Uh, we've gone from an all-white church to a church that is stunningly multi-ethnic and every time you see, in every level of leadership. I've got people at my church who are giving to my church and who are engaged in my church who, if they just wanted to a church that they preferred, wouldn't be at my church. Because they're going to a church that isn't like they choose because they believe this church is making a difference. They're mm -hmm. engaged in a mission. So I used to say as a young pastor, when people say, you have an agenda, and I'd apologize. No, I don't. Now I don't. If you don't have an agenda, you shouldn't be a leader. I don't apologize <laughs> for having an agenda. I apologize if I didn't make it clear. Mm -hmm. This is our agenda. This is where we're going. And we're going to measure it because we believe God it came from God and we're going to see fruit. So I appreciate what these guys are saying. I'm so on board. If you can't measure it, you got a slogan. You don't have a vision. That's awesome. Very well said. All right. So that all of this is fantastic. We're hearing these pastors, really great vision casters, talk about how uh, the church can look different in the future and how with that we can impact more people's lives and really make a difference, as Pastor Rick just shared. But this is what I've seen through the years. Having a big, bold vision is not enough. You have to clarify strategies, systems, action plans to actually move that vision, get that bold move uh, moving forward in order to see the, the actual results of that. So where I want to spend our remaining moments is to talk about how do we clarify those next steps, those systems and strategies needed to accomplish vision. Defining a bold move to make is great but it's ultimately your strategies and your systems that are needed to move it forward. And Rick, maybe we'll go to you first. And I think we can say that a slogan probably doesn't need strategies and systems. So if you're wondering if your vision is clear, uh, but be, uh, can you speak to that importance though, Rick, of not just identifying the vision or the bold moves, but also to clearly define your strategies for accomplishing it. I know your team there has rallied around some of these big moves these past few years. So can you just share your example with us? Well, I believe maybe it was Derwin that said uh, assignment brings alignment. That's one of the most powerful things about having a clear vision is whether it's budgeting or it's staffing or it's ministry planning. When you have a vision, you can bring alignment. In our case, though, what we learned is that every vision go we had needed to have someone who was going to be, if you will, the shepherd of that vision, who was going to 
uh, be able to keep. In other words, I can say to someone, okay, how many asylum seeking families have we helped so far? And I can get an answer within a couple of hours Mm -hmm. because someone is running with that. We're not just hoping it happens. What we've learned, uh, I learned this early on. If I said to my church years ago, we all should pray more. Everybody would say yes and feel guilty. (laughs) <laughs> if I said now out in the lobby, we've got a chart and we're going to do a 24 uh, hour prayer. And what hour are you going to sign up for? They'd go out and do it. I gave them a way to step into what I called them to. So when you cast a vision for a church, what are your on ramps for every part of that vision? What is the on ramp? So people can not just get excited, but actually step into mm-hmm. it. Uh, I, I, you know, we have, a. I could give you a lot of examples. Uh, I'll just give you one. So one of our, one of our goals uh, in generations is the next five years to raise up or train or equip 300 new leaders that leaders aren't found. Leaders are formed. So uh, in on for women, we've, we've got a ministry called gathered groups where my wife is example, and she leads a group of women. They met last night. They should have been watching the Rangers, but they were praying to the Lord. Instead. <laughs> and uh, how do you know they weren't? Every, how do you know they weren't praying for a win last night, Rick? There you go. Uh, righteous, the prayers of the righteous availeth much, right? But my wife has a younger woman who she's mentoring uh, to teach her how to lead a group. And so we have about 50 something groups like this and 50 something young women getting mentored. With our men, our strategy is uh, we got from North Point, so we're called Radical Mentoring, mm-hmm. where former elders and older men take uh, groups of eight young men and they commit to a year of, of reading and discipling and praying together. And so through the first two years, we've seen about 196 future leaders equipped in an intergenerational uh, uh, context. Now, again, that's just an example, and maybe there's better ways to do that. But you need a way. You need a way, an on-ramp, so that whatever you say the vision is, someone can step into it. And then you need also a plan to regularly bring that vision before the church, celebrate those wins so people don't forget. And they say, I want to be a part of that. How do I do that? I love that. And uh, just making the vision actionable, making the bold move actionable. Mm -hmm. That's the key takeaway Mm -hmm. for me on that. Derwin, um, maybe if you could just pick one of the bold moves that you referenced earlier and give us some examples of the new strategies or the new systems that you've had to put in place to make sure that it's actually leading your church forward in whatever that bold move looked like for your ministry. Yeah. Yeah, so so hot off the presses, right? So uh, we want to have these multi-site campuses for the glory of God. So something that Pastor Rick just said is pastors are vision casters. That rhymes. You know that man is a preacher. Mm-hmm. Um, so 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 <laughs> so there's a difference between being a vision caster and a strategic implementer. And so it's vital mm-hmm. that you have teammates who, when you cast vision, can implement strategically to move people. So I love the vision cast, man. I can see it. And one of the areas where I've grown as a pastor has been I may be able to see it and I may already be there, but that does no good if I'm not in the present and empowering leaders to make a strategic plan. So we're in a process right now of strategic planning. And what we had done in the past here at Transformation Church is we had been too top heavy with the executive leadership team making the strategic plan. So what we've done is we've slowed down and put the the process and the dreaming of a strategic plan into the hands of our directors. One, that creates ownership. Two, they're going to pray in desperation. Three, it's, it's, it's unifying. So, um, um, Kidder has a a eight step model of strategic planning. One, establish a sense of urgency. So we want to reach these campuses. We we want to have four campuses because we want people to know Christ and to make him known. We want to create a multi-ethnic church, create a guiding coalition. That's why we have the directors. Uh, We have vision. We have strategy, communicating the change, empowering people, short-term goals, um, um, consolidating gains and producing more change, anchoring new approaches in the culture. So we've worked that out at Transformation Church. And if you'd let me, um, this is what it looks like for for, for us. So it's number one, we want to reach people for Jesus, period. For God so loved the world 
Uh, we want to develop a servant leader culture. We don't use the word volunteer. We use servant leader culture. And from that, we want to see more ministry leaders and pastors that develop um, communications. How we talk um, is important. Tony, you and Amy said something that's really cool. Uh, I listened to the podcast. You said this culture and communication is people like us do things like this. I was like, that's so good. We bet we have to give credit to Seth Godin on oh, that one, just for the record, because that's where we okay. heard it from. All right. So, yeah. But I like when I'm mixed up with Seth okay, Godin. Dope. <laughs> um, so we want to look at what what is our staffing and ministry practice, pr practice events and offerings. Also, our digital strategy. Digital for us is a front door, but it's also discipleship, evangelism, outreach. So we're developing a strategic plan in such a way that is unifying, but it's getting greater ownership from our directors. And so they're now starting to feel the stuff that I feel, the stuff that our other elder pastors and executive directors feel, which is creating ownership. And also it's breaking down the silos that naturally happen because we're requiring that they work to Together. And so a vision without a strategy is frustration. That's very good. And if you're a nerd like me and want to dive deeper into those eight uh, kind of tactics uh, for driving change, um, that comes from John Cotter's book, Leading Change. And he's done a lot of other writing out through the years on that. But it's a great book. If you're especially for a lot of churches that are watching today, uh, if you're considering a, a bold move, that's going to involve change. And having some best practices on how to lead your church mm -hmm. through that change, um, that may be a resource that would help you through that. Amy? Yeah, I just like what you said too, Derwin, about, you know, you, you need to run for a while with these uh, initiatives, but you also need to pause and see where you've made progress, celebrate that. You know, mini sprints is what Tony and I often talk about. Uh, and also to make sure we've just got, we're getting the results we want and we can pivot you know, within the planning, if we aren't seeing the results we were hoping for, but that's a key part. Jonathan, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, you are, you shared earlier, so I know you're using systems and strategies, but can you give us a look into how you guys use those to move your bold moves forward? Yeah. I, hey, shout out to Seth Godin. I, the, he got referenced in this podcast, the, the Purple Cow <laughs> and the Dip. Those are two books every pastor leader should read. They're yes. so good. Uh, but like in terms of one church CEO, I think how we fuel it, like we, we like to say all the time, or this would be something that we believe that there's no standalone su successes in our ecosystem. Uh, we don't have a single ministry winning. If, if one ministry is winning and it's not fueling the entire ecosystem, then it's taking away energy from it. So it's like having a, a women's ministry that's killing it and nothing else is. Well, then that's killing you. Like the, so we have what we call, mm. we have a strategy, we call it stackable. So everything in our church is stackable and it's based on, it comes from the business world. There's a company here in Canada that is uh, a, a vertically integrated company as opposed to a horizontally integrated company. A vertically integrated, hard to build, very difficult. It's a, not a public company, it's family owned and it has 300 companies inside of the umbrella. And it's its own customers. Mm. So every time they add a new site, they have they have uh, they have three hundred new customers. So they own the entire chain, the resources to the uh, industry production to the retail. Like it's a it's an integrated. So they have self propelling momentum all the time. I watch churches look for momentum, try to find momentum, and then try to hold on to it. So we decided, why don't we just stack everything so we have constant internal momentum. So everything is stacked. Everything has an input. Everything has an output. So all of our bold moves are supported by that. So all of our bold moves have an input and an output. There's an input from something and an output into something. So we create energy and momentum in our organizational structure. And that means every staff member has to own all of the bold moves. So it's kind of fun to get the finance team coming up with their strategy on how we'll make the church sticky for the next generation. Like they have to come up with ideas for that. The facility team has to come up with ideas for that. The whole the whole staff team, our elders, our deacons, uh, our volunteers, like we own these bold moves together and they all stack into something and stack against something. 
So like every time one move starts to win, all of them start to win. Uh, all of the ministries get fueled. Uh, and it, it really came out of our next gen ministry. We began to, we were just bleeding, going from kids into junior high ministry, going from junior high to youth. And the, the drop off from young adults to adults was palatable. And once we began to recognize and watch the gaps, so we pastor all the gaps in the, in that stackable system, all it did was create not just engagement and growth, but people stuck. And it fueled ministries around the successful ones begin to share their energy with other ones. So that stackable strategy is really key to us fueling our five bull moves. And that's really what's, I think, even helped us accomplish two of them, two of the five that were supposed to be in five years. I uh, got done so quickly was a lot of it was the stackability. The momentum was all the flywheel was already in effect. I'm thinking, can you give us just one example of how one feeds into another? As you describe that, that one feeds into this and then it pours out into another. Yeah, like I think too, just to give some clarity around it, because I think Rick referenced this in Duran uh, to a degree, like the like metrics are interesting things that churches keep. Uh, they'll keep their finances. We know that uh, they'll keep their attendance. But we're really interested in the engagement metrics because engagement uh, for us. And we noticed a long time ago through our study that if somebody served at one church deal, they're more likely to be a giver. They're more likely to be in a community group. They're more likely to volunteer. Uh, no other metric did that for us. Uh, community group people didn't always serve, didn't always give. Uh, there was a lot of pieces that we realized. So serving went to our number one metric. If, we, if you're involved in our church, you got skin in the game, you're likely to be involved in all that we're doing. So when we're building out, you're talking about how one of those bold moves, like blowing open the doors of the church, we, we serve uh, 400 refugee immigrant families every week in our food banks. And so they're from all over the world. Uh, there's over a thousand people that get served that are connected to these 400 families every week. Well, that was a standalone ministry by itself, kind of winning or losing by itself. And we, we were like, the, the, we, we, that's sideways energy then. We, this is something good we want to do as part of our bold move initiative, but it wasn't stacked into the church. So the next gen team developed a strategy for how do we care for the, the family's children while they're on site and creating moments and carnivals and festivals that they could be a part of to stack it into our kids ministry. Then uh, some of our other uh, staff uh, begin to develop vision on how they could serve. And it's always with a heart not to get them in our church, hard to serve them. And, you know, if you love people, you know how attractive that is, friends, like uh, loving people with no strings attached. Duran mentioned that, you know, when you're going to schools and when you don't have an agenda, it's powerful. When your agenda is just to be generous, it's it's un, it's unavoidable. It's unignorable. And, you know, our slogan for our love army is being unignorable, an unignorable force of good in the city of Toronto. <laughs> and good is unignorable. I'm joining that church. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So that, that's how we try to stack in. We, we strategize as a team. Like, how do we take these big things and begin to stack them together so that people ultimately, we'd love them all to find Jesus. Uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the redemptive purposes of Christ. I mean, that's why I'm in this. I love seeing people come to faith in Jesus and it does something for the believers. Uh, and it keeps us, our eyes off ourselves, keeps our eyes outward. That's been significant and changing. And, you know, you guys at the Unstuck Group were so pivotal, helping us strategize around those five bold moves. And then again, with our stackable environments, it just accelerated. It was like dynamite. Mm -hmm. Well, we're in a moment going to transition to some live Q&A. But before we do that, I just want to thank Jonathan, Derwin, Rick for joining us. Amy, any question that we did that we invited the right people to today's conversation? Yeah, Derwin I said, I want to go so. to your church. I want to go to all these churches, be a part of them. That's right. That's right. And actually, I think I've told all three of these guys, if I lived mm -hmm. in your cities, I would want you to be my pastor. I'd want to be a part of your churches. So um, go to Derwin's church, but tithe to mine. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we could use the American dollars up here. Our currency is not worth as much. So a little bit is a long way here. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, in a moment, we'll dive into some live Q&A.
Well, that was great to hear a second time, Tony. I don't know about you. It was, yeah. And those, I mean, they're just three incredible pastors and they're leading such healthy churches. And they they were all at different points talking about some of the significant life change that they're seeing in their ministries. But all three of mm-hmm. them, um, it's just, it's really an amazing story. So, and what a privilege, Amy, for us to have had the opportunity in recent years to walk mm-hmm. alongside all three of those ministries. So yes, um, that w- that was a lot of fun. Yeah, hearing about uh, Pastor Durbin's bold moves in, in his humble beginnings where this is where church plants go to die. And now I believe they're going to transform even more communities through their multi-site strategy. All right, we have some questions that came in today, Tony, during the webinar. And uh, I'll start with this one. Uh, they asked, what's the process for determining bold moves? Is it the sole responsibility of the lead pastor? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. And certainly the lead pastor needs to have a key voice in in trying to determine what is it, God, that you're calling us to do next. But um, Amy, you know, as we've worked with churches through the the years that where we seen them see the most power around getting clarity and alignment and really honing in on that specific bold move that God has for the church that typically that involves conversation with a group of key leaders in the ministry, either staff leaders or lay leaders. And it's not something that you want to open up to everyone. This is not a place for a church Mm -hmm. survey or a church vote. Um, But having a dozen or less key leaders from your ministry come together to pray through, God, what is it? What what do you have for us uh, moving forward? Um, And then to to talk through that and to throw out ideas and to process together. Um, That's the power, I think, of the body of Christ coming together, where we're all bringing unique perspectives and experiences and discerning together, God, what do you have next for our ministry, where we can continue to have great kingdom impact in people's Mm -hmm. lives? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, Bottom line, no, I don't think senior pastors have to own this all themselves. And I've talked to enough senior pastors through the years that that's probably a relief um, because if you're Mm -hmm. like me, I don't feel like I'm necessarily a strong vision caster and I need other people around me to be able to shape future vision. Yeah. All right. The next question was, you know, in today's world, what's the right time frame for bold moves? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it shorter than that? What's your perspective, Tony? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. This is something that has changed through the years. When I first uh, got into ministry 25 years ago, we were working through a 10-year vision. Um, And uh, gosh, the world is changing so rapidly right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it wasn't that long ago we said 10 years is too long, but maybe, maybe we should instead be focusing on three to five years. And then we had the pandemic and everything else we've experienced in recent years. And so I do think there needs to be kind of a longer term framework for where we're sensing God's taking us. But I still believe in this moment, the priority is what what bold move are we pursuing today? And then in these next 12 months specifically, what's what's what are the priority initiatives that we need to engage to move that mm-hmm. bold move forward? So uh, it's, essentially, we've gone from a 10-year uh, vision to we know the bold move, and let's just focus on what needs to happen in the next 12 months. Mm-hmm. That's great. All right, City Place Church asked this, how do you release and communicate these bold moves to the congregation? Yeah, so I, I mentioned in the chat, we'll uh, we'll include this. Uh, Jordan's listening, so she's going to remember to do this because I would forget. Uh, we actually have a great resource that our team has pulled together on how to cast a new vision in your church. And so I, it's a perceptive question to be asking because there's there's really two different things at play. One is getting clarity about that bold move that God has for your church. But then you actually have to cast that vision and rally your church around it. And so um, it really does begin with making sure that uh, we kind of start with a smaller circle of people in our church and then work out, work our way out. So uh, in other words, we want to rally our lay leaders, 
our staff leaders, then our volunteers, the people that are more connected to the ministry before Mm -hmm. we start casting that vision to the entire congregation. Um, But if we do that effectively, Amy, you've heard me talk about the I, I had the sun blocked for a moment in my office. And now I have this light. <laughs> it's as if God is saying, this is very critical. Listen to what Tony has Listen to say. Listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, if if we are effective in this, and by that, again, I'm talking about both components. We, we have clarity about exactly what God's calling us to do next. And then we effectively cast vision from smaller circles out to larger circles in our church. When we do that effectively, we are able to rally our church around that and so that people feel like they want to be invested with their prayer, their time, their financial resources. And so, again, we we get a lot more practical on what that needs to look like in that resource, and we'll make sure in the follow-up we include a link to that resource so that you can take a look mm-hmm. at that. I could summarize it. David Vaughn on our team, who's been on past webinars, his little phrase is, you got to drip it before you drop it. And I think there you go. that's what you're saying. You drip it to some you know, key insiders and slowly build it out so that by the time your congregation's hearing it, you've already got a big fan base. People have been praying about it and looking for ways uh, you know, to move it forward. So, um, Tony, the next question they asked, what's the importance of identifying a champion for each move? And then the follow-up is, how do we identify the champion on our team and in our church? And I think those are both important because we've seen bold moves move forward because a church has done this right. And we've seen bold moves kind of fizzle out because they haven't done it right. So let's talk first about the importance of identifying a champion for each bold move. Yeah. So, Amy, um, I've been watching some of the recent presidential debates And I've learned how to not respond to the question that you just asked, but to answer the Mm -hmm. question that I want to answer. And I'm even going to take it a step further um, because I wanted to ask you as a result of this conversation and this question about champions plays into it. It's one thing to get clarity about our bold moves, but oftentimes, and we we talk about this, um, if we're going to move move forward in a new direction with a new strategy, a new bold move, a new vision, many times we need to make some structure changes in order to support that. So, I mean, we've talked a lot in previous content on that. Maybe just one or two specific practical next steps churches can consider um, as they're want. Now they've defined their bold move, but how do we put that into action? And uh, maybe that champion can come into your thoughts here. Yeah, um, you know, it's always important to have an owner. And I think everyone who's listening is nodding. But it's amazing how often we actually don't put that into practice. Somebody needs to feel the ownership. And that owner has to have some skills to move a project forward. We often talk about them as the project managers. And as well, they need to build a team around them. This isn't an individual kind of task. And then, of course, when you look at your structure, um, I often relate it to the old wineskins. The light's not coming on me. I must not sound as important as you, Tony. <laughs> I can't get rid of it now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it there. Um, building a team around to actually move that initiative forward. And when we talk about the structure side of things, it's almost like you can't put new wine in old wine skin. And so in order to actually shift people's focus, priorities, behaviors, I think you have to look at how do we need to modify our structure in order to get forward momentum on this. Mm-hmm. So a champion is really important. And then I think it's also important to say that the champion should not be the lead pastor. Um, they, they can't carry that. They should be the primary vision caster. They should be the person who's rallying the congregation staff around that, but they shouldn't be the person actually leading this initiative. And if you're in a smaller church, that just means if you don't have the staff board either, that's where you can look to some high capacity lay leaders to actually carry and move this forward. But again, with structure, they need to feel a bit of a part of a team if it's truly championing a big, bold move at your church. What would you add, Tony? No, that's great, Amy. Um, as we're wrapping up, I saw someone also submit a question about we're in a smaller community. Um, and so what bold moves in a smaller community should we be considering? Um, let me give you two uh, quick thoughts here. Number one, every church 
Uh, one of the best bold moves you can make is how can we design an experience in our Sunday morning worship so that people in our church want to invite friends and family to participate as well. For a lot of churches, that's really the key bold move that they need to be considering because it's there that we have the opportunity to share the good news, to invite other people to take steps towards Jesus and the context of relationship that can be built in a church and especially smaller churches and smaller communities, you have a leg up. Uh, you are better positioned to connect people into relationships. So that's probably the, the key bold move. But then I would just um, connect with your local school system. Uh, so connect with an elementary school or a middle school in your community and talk to the principal or the teachers and hear from them the biggest challenges they're seeing with the families that are connected to the school, that will point to the key bold move that your church could be engaging in your community outside the walls mm -hmm. of the church. So those are two quick thoughts that I think really a church of any size could be considering as you're trying to get clarity about your bold move. Great. Well, Tony, I think that uh, we are out of time. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And of course, we'll be sending out the replay to everyone and those additional resources that Tony mentioned. But Thanks for taking time out of your day to spend an hour with us. And we will be praying for you that you will find clarity on your next bold move.